Still very weird. All right, okay. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to our, this is the Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center series. This is the second of our, um, actually the third, I should say, of uh, our series of programs that for this spring. Holocaust Center is, um, we do a number, we do programs bringing in scholars and survivors, like we have a survivor next week. And uh, we also do conferences and uh, even art-related programs. And uh, just last week, we inaugurated our um, library collection, thanks to uh, Emily Brown and the staff of the learning, uh, our library. Um, we have a, a wonderful collection of over a 1,000 books which is available not only for our campus uh, community, but also for the community. So any of you out there interested in taking out books on the Holocaust and genocide, we have the best collection in the region. Um, so that, that was a program we did last week. And we, are, uh, we have one more program, well, we have two more programs, one in June, which you'll hear about. The next week we have um, a program of a survivor who, uh, from Greece, uh, will be Thursday at four, and you'll you'll be hearing about that or getting Zoom links or certainly come in person. So anyway, uh, welcome to everybody, both on Zoom and people who are here in person. Uh, as usual, I just want to thank a few people. I'm going to thank the college for its support, our faculty and staff, and certainly our students, and also um, I want to thank the IT division and also our communications division, which produces a lot of our uh, uh, flyers and whatnot. Um, also, um, I want to thank um, Kate Rose, who's doing the bloom, the bloom? What are you doing? <laughs> doing the, uh, the tech part here. Thank you. And Emily Brown, who also doing that. So we have uh, Tech is not my thing, so I'm very fortunate to have folks like Emily and, and Kate to help me with that. Um, let's see, anybody? Also, I'd like to thank uh, our, we have funders, we have a number of funders. We accept independent, you know, individual contributions, it all goes through our uh, BCC Foundation. But we also, the, uh, the uh, New Bedford Jewish Federation has been a funder of us for since our beginning, this is our sixth, seventh year, really. And uh, the Bristol County Savings Bank has also f uh, provided funding to us for the last number of years. And we have other funders, but we're, college, of course, supports us, but we look for, for outside support as well. Anyway, I'm sure I left something out, but um, I want, am very happy to introduce our two speakers today. We are been always fortunate to getting top-notch scholars, and those people, those two today are in that category. First of all, um, we have um, John Maholchek, to learn how to pronounce John's last name, and um, he's on Zoom. He's a professor and director of film studies in the art history and film department of Boston College. He's the author and editor of 14 books including Filming the End of the Holocaust, Confront Resistance in Nazi Germany and Nazi Law from Nuremberg to Nuremberg. Since 1992, he has been a documentary filmmaker whose works include The Cross and the Star, Jews, Christians, and the Holocaust, Nazi Medicine in the Shadow of the Reich, Creating Harmony with Displaced uh, Jewish Orchestra from St. Ottolin, and writing on the wall, remembering the Berlin Wall. Uh, also, Nazi, Nazi law, legally blind. And he also did one on um, Jews and Irish in, in Boston. So obviously, John's been very busy, and those movies, films are, are amazing. So John is our first, our, I think John goes second. second. Yeah. John will go second. Uh, our first speaker is Michael Bryant. Uh, professor of History and Legal Studies at Bryan University at, in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Um, 
he was a prior speaker here. Uh, he can see what he talked about. All our programs are linked to our webpage. But anyway, he specializes in the impact of the Holocaust on the law and human rights. He's uh, on German criminal law, international humanitarian law. He's the author of five books, Confronting the Good Death, Youth in Nazi Euthanasia on Trial, um, Eyewitness to Genocide, the Operation of Reinhardt Death Camp Trials, 1995-66, Nazi Crimes and Their Punishment, 1943-1950, A Short History with Documents, uh, the history, uh, and then um, a world history of war crimes from antiquity to the present. And now uh, working together on a book and also a film, I guess, right, on the subject that they will be talking about today. So I'm more than pleased to introduce, first of all, uh, Michael Bryant, Professor Michael Bryant, and then we'll hear from John. Good afternoon to everybody. I greatly appreciate you all coming out. Um, I noticed that people are losing their masks, at least a, a few of them at my own university. We, for the first time in two years, we went uh, maskless today, and I could actually recognize my students for the first time in two, in two years. So it was quite a momentous day for us. Thank you very much for those of you who are online as well. Uh, welcome to our presentation today. Um, I'm going to speak first for 20 minutes or so, and, uh, and then I'm going to turn the, the podium over to, to John, who is uh, virtual today. John will talk for a while, and we'll lay the, the groundwork then for uh, the documentary film. We are not showing the entire documentary film. It's, it's just too long. It's almost an hour long. But John was able to uh, string together some of the you know, uh, greatest hits, I guess, of the, the, doc the documentary. And it's about a 15, 16 minute film, which I'll try to queue up here once John has finished speaking. Books have been in the news a good bit, as all of us know who read the newspapers these days, uh, within the past year or so. It seems like nearly every day we hear stories in the American press of efforts to remove certain titles from library shelves or then to delete them entirely from school classrooms. I quote from a, a New York Times article from just a little while ago, February 8th, uh, 2022. In Wyoming, a county prosecutor's office considered charges against, char criminal charges against library employees for stocking books like sex is a funny word. In Oklahoma, a bill was introduced in the state Senate that would prohibit public school libraries from keeping books on hand that focus on sexual identity or gender identity. In Tennessee, the McMinn County Board of Education voted to remove the Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel Mouse from an eighth grade module on the Holocaust because of nudity and curse words. The Times article noted, quote, the most frequent targets are books about race, gender, and sexuality, unquote. Now, in post-war Germany, by contrast, the censor's attention fell not on books about gender and sexuality. Rather, the attention was on the notorious autobiography of Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf. So I'd like to talk this afternoon about the post-war history of Mein Kampf, its republication in 2016, and German reactions to Mein Kampf's reemergence in German bookstores. And then I'll close with some general observations about Mein Kampf and why it may be worth re-engaging, or maybe for the first time engaging at all, with this text today. We might begin with the post-war story of Mein Kampf in 1945, when the Allied Control Council in Germany dissolved all Nazi organizations including its main publishing house, the Franz Ayer Press. Ayer was responsible for publishing Mein Kampf and held the copyright to the book. Because its headquarters were in Munich, Ayer's property and assets were transferred to the state of Bavaria. In 1948, all of Ayer's copyrights likewise became the property of the Bavarians, specifically the Bavarian Ministry of Finance. 
These assets included the rights to Mein Kampf. Thereafter, and for the next 70 years, the Bavarian State Ministry refused to permit any republication of Hitler's book. Historians approached the ministry and argued that a critical edition of Mein Kampf should be published, much as critical editions of Hitler's speeches, Joseph Goebbels' diaries, and other Nazi writings had been. In every case, the Bavarians rebuffed these requests. The embargo on republishing Mein Kampf in German continued until its copyright expired 70 years after Hitler's death. And for this reason, Mein Kampf entered the public domain on January 1st, 2016. Several years before that time, however, the Bavarian government had already commissioned a critical edition of the book to be published in German once the copyright had expired. The commission was given to the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, an organization that specializes in research and writing on the history of Nazism. Even after nearly 70 years, political and cultural leaders were jittery about the book. In 2013, the Central Council of Jews in Germany protested republication of Mein Kampf, and their argument was this. How could the Bavarian government prohibit neo-Nazi rallies while subsidizing the publication of the Bible of Nazism? They had a point. The government defended its decision, pointing out that the Institute for Contemporary History and not the state of Bavaria, would be solely responsible for preparing the critical edition. Furthermore, permission was granted to the Institute and the Institute alone to, republish, to uh, republish Mein Kampf. German law thus disallows any other republication of the book. The Institute's critical edition is the only game in town, at least legally, and I, I would note I just looked this up the other day. Um, I would note that a right-wing publisher in Leipzig has reprinted the 1943 edition of Mein Kampf without annotations and in seeming defiance of the law. I don't know uh, whether legal action has actually been taken against this publisher, but as of 2017, the Leipzig prosecutor's office was still conducting an investigation into it. I don't know the current status of that investigation. The critical edition, perhaps against all expectation, has become a bestseller since its publication in 2016. The first print run of 4,000 copies quickly sold out. Sales eventually totaled 14,000, landing Mein Kampf on the German bestseller list. And even as its popularity soared, voices were raised criticizing Mein Kampf's republication. The Bavarian education minister opposed teaching Mein Kampf to students, declaring, quote, this book still causes deep pain for a lot of people, and we're not going to have a single reprint of it going into our schools, unquote. Likewise, the head of the Jewish community in Munich doubted the pedagogical value of Mein Kampf. She said it was, quote, irresponsible to include such libelous invective against Jews in schools, unquote. The team of institute historians assigned to compile the critical edition were well aware of such objections. They were determined that the text of Mein Kampf would be balanced against critical commentary provided by the editors. As a lead editor of the project, Christian Hartmann said in a media interview, quote, we don't let any of Hitler's claims pass without our interpretation in our footnotes, unquote. In John and Susan Bakalzik's and my recent book of essays entitled Mein Kampf and the Holocaust, A Prelude to Genocide, the deputy director of the Institute for Contemporary History, Magnus Brechtgen, writes that publishing Mein Kampf without scholarly commentary was simply out of the question. Instead, from the start, the plan was to provide extensive background information, cross-references to scholarly literature, and critical commentary on the book. 
the detailed footnotes, and an appropriately censorious attitude toward Hitler's many, many claims in Mein Kampf were to be the antidote against neo-Nazi appropriations of the text. Some scholars have greeted these justifications with skepticism. In his review of the critical edition, historian Anson Robenbach asks, quote, can a mythological symbol be neutralized by a phalanx of annotations, however erudite? Can Hitler's typical diatribes on how Jews are the great masters as liars be de demystified with a long commentary on Arthur Schopenhauer and his appropriation by Dietrich Eckhart? Unquote. Similarly, a prominent biographer of Hitler, Peter Langerich, doubts that, in his words, quote, an army of footnotes can stand watch like a sentinel over the scandalous writ, unquote. These concerns aside, the team from the Institute moved ahead with the project. They began in August 2012 and completed their work by late 2015. When it finally appeared in two hefty volumes, I actually brought uh, the critical edition with me in case somebody would like to take a look at it maybe during Q&A or after. When it first appeared in these two volumes in January 2016, the critical edition was nearly 2,000 pages long. In addition to an 84-page introduction, it was arrayed with more than 3,700 footnotes. This book is not for the faint of heart. In the view of the Institute's director, Andreas Wiersching, the aim of the footnotes is to demystify Mein Kampf by providing both context for Hitler's assertions and correction for his numerous falsehoods. Ultimately, the commentary was intended to puncture the mystique that has surrounded this text since the end of World War II. This point raises a question of what precisely Hitler's purposes were in writing Mein Kampf. To address this question, the circumstances of the book's origins should be considered. Contrary to popular perception, Mein Kampf was published in two volumes, not in one. The single volume edition comes later in 1930. But the first edition was published in two volumes, the first in 1925, the second in 1927. Hitler wrote the first volume during his imprisonment in Landsberg prison in 1924. He dictated the second volume to his secretary at a hotel in Bechtesgaden in the Ober Salzburg in 1926. Hitler had definite political and rhetorical goals that he pursued in Mein Kampf. We should recall that Hitler wrote this book for his followers, to whom he wanted to present himself as a man of destiny who would lead Germany to the promised land. We too often assume at a distance of a century that the Nazis were the inevitable extremist party to seize power in post-war Germany and that Hitler was its inevitable leader. But neither of these assumptions was by any means clear at the time that Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. The Nazis competed for electoral support against a hundred other extremist right-wing groups. In Munich alone, Hitler had to contend with 70 such groups, all of whom claimed to be the answer to Germany's distress. Hence, Hitler believed he had to secure two statuses with Mein Kampf. The first, his own position as the leader of the Nazis, and the second, the preeminence of his party as Germany's savior. If Hitler's insistence on the primacy of himself and his party is one dominant theme in Mein Kampf, another is the consistent ideology that serves as its unifying thread. The centrality of Hitler's ideology to the book may be its most conspicuous and arresting feature. Hitler sets forth in Mein Kampf a theory of history, economics, and society that characterized his political praxis from the 1920s until his suicide in Berlin in April 1945. According to this theory, all of history is driven by the struggle between racial groups. At the center of this conflict is the defender of higher culture, according to Hitler, as well as the vessel of racial purity, the so-called Aryan, 
This figure representing all goodness in the world is pitted, Hitler writes, in an existential struggle against diabolical racial inferiors, especially the Jews. In Hitler's worldview, the Jews represented forces of chaos, malice, and subversion of the higher civilization defended by the Aryan. For Hitler, the Germans and a small number of other Nordic people were synonymous with the Aryans. Altogether, he thought that at least 70 million Germanic people in Central Europe formed the, the so-called racial nucleus of the Aryan race. Furthermore, the fate not only of the Aryans, but of all civilization depended on the outcome of the war between the Aryans and the Jews. Race was the key to Hitler's concept of history. It was also the key to his conception of politics. He believed he had the historical mission to create a racial state in which the Aryans would reign supreme until members of inferior races had been purged from this state. Moreover, he was convinced the racially superior Germans would be unable to flourish without more land for their growing population. The acquisition of land could only come at the expense of other nations. This meant that Hitler's racial state would have to prepare for war. What would be the source of the land the racial state demanded for its prosperity and power? As it turns out, Eastern Europe was the lodestone and not just because its sprawling immensity beckoned to Hitler's imagination. It was attractive also because, in Hitler's view, it was the home of Judeo-Bolshevism. It's a phrase that Hitler uh, uses in Mein Kampf repeatedly. The Jews, according to Hitler, used communism to overthrow other governments, as they had supposedly done in Russia in 1917, and to institute their own tyrannous rule. As the leader of the victorious racial state, Hitler would lead Germany in a crusade to defeat the Judeo-Bolshevists in the USSR and seize their territory for German resettlement. These features of Hitler's ideology and Mein Kampf, features that scholars have tended to downplay in the 75 plus years since the end of the war, informed Hitler's politics throughout his career. They consist not only in his belief in the racial state and the, need, and the need for what he called Lebensraum or living space, but in Hitler's rejection of democracy, his insistence on the unity of the people as a precondition for victorious warfare, and the willingness, once the Nazis seized power, to eliminate their supposed racial and political enemies. All of these themes emerge from the pages of Mein Kampf and all of them would be incorporated into the Third Reich's domestic and foreign policy after 1933. This latter point touches on a question I'd like to conclude my talk with this afternoon and yield the podium to my colleague John Bikalzik. It's a question that confronted us during the filming of our documentary film on Mein Kampf but also in the symposium that we held at Boston College on this topic in April 2019 and on our volume of collected essays on Mein Kampf and the Holocaust. It's a question with which the Bavarian state government and the Institute for Contemporary History both wrestled as they embarked on the task of republishing Mein Kampf after three quarters of a century. It's a question that may be on the minds of many of you listening to my presentation this, uh, this afternoon, namely, why on earth should anyone read the Bible of Nazism today? What possible value can there be in revisiting a text that has caused so much trauma, havoc, and suffering to the world and its peoples? I'd like to suggest some reasons why humane men and women, men and women of goodwill today, might read Mein Kampf in 2022, nearly 100 years after it was written. Several years ago, the late German historian Eberhard Jekyll suggested an argument for reading Mein Kampf. He said that rarely, if ever, 
had a ruler written down beforehand what he would later do the way that Hitler did in Mein Kampf. The editors of the critical edition make a similar argument in their footnotes, demonstrating the many assertions of Hitler in Mein Kampf that would be fulfilled during the 12-year rule of the Third Reich. And I'll mention just a handful of these. In Mein Kampf, Hitler rants against what he calls the wailing letters from home, by which he means letters that were sent to German soldiers during World War I by their families and their sweethearts. These letters, Hitler claims, demoralized the soldiers and weakened their combat readiness. The editors see in Hitler's complaint about these letters a foreshadowing of the anti-treachery laws he would decree during World War II, laws that made subversion of the German fighting spirit a capital offense. Elsewhere in Mein Kampf, Hitler charged the so-called ne'er-do-wells in Parliament during World War I of failing to fully harness the manpower available to them. The critical edition editors believe that this rebuke prefigured Hitler's mobilization of elderly men and of children to fight as, as Volkssturm soldiers in the waiting months of the war. Similarly, the editors see in Hitler's declaration in Mein Kampf that deserters must die in anticipation of his harsh military justice administered during World War II, which claimed the lives of tens of thousands of German soldiers. In brief, the editors of the critical edition discern in Mein Kampf the outline of a dictatorship that would radicalize during the war and plunge Germany into genocide and self-destruction. All of this aside, the editors of the critical edition do not think that Mein Kampf contains a programmatic statement of Hitler's intentions once his racial state came to power. Rather, as Magnus Bretkin notes in our Mein Kampf in the Holocaust volume, the focus of Hitler's attention before 1933 was on seizing power. His political goals would be pursued thereafter as opportunities arose for their realization. The absolute bedrock of his entire political program was his self-image as the iron-willed leader of the Nazi party, his historical mission to create the racial state and expand its borders through warfare, and the faith of his followers in that mission. These are among Mein Kampf's dominant elements. Ultimately, the absence of a specific concrete program of action from Mein Kampf does not detract from the value of reading it today. I lay specific emphasis on the word today because we are seeing in our own time a rebirth of the kinds of ethno-nationalism, anti-democratic politics, and aggressive imperialism that accompanied the rise of the Nazis. The critical study of Mein Kampf, of not only its text, but also of its origins, influences, and impact can be helpful for us in defending democracy against its would-be assassins. Such a study might enable us to identify illiberal ideologies at large in our world, and not merely to identify them, but to unmask and discredit them for their attacks on human liberty, the rule of law, and the dignity of all people. Not without irony, the republication of Mein Kampf could serve the defense and preservation of the very thing Hitler dedicated his life to destroying. I can think of no finer usage of Hitler's evil book today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And I will invite uh, my dear colleague and friend, John Mikulczyk, to present his, his own talk from um, his study in his house back in Wayland, Massachusetts. John, you're, you're up, my friend. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I always learn something from Professor Michael Bryan. Uh, he has been a very strong historical uh, consultant all the way through the process. As soon as the Bible of Hitler was republished in 2016, I met with Christian Hartmann, 
with the narrator of our documentary, Professor Michael Ressler, and we decided that this needed a visual element to the spread of understanding more concretely Hitler's Mein Kampf. It is almost 100 years since this was published originally in 1925. And what we'd like to do at that time, as in our discussion, we wanted to see if we could take the root of Hitler's ideas and create a documentary that would enlighten and help us understand it, especially if this text was genocidal in its essence, or was it simply laying the ground for what would come afterwards? So in our meeting, we decided that we would hold a conference and we invited top scholars uh, who came to the conference from uh, all over the United States plus Germany. And we were able to present various ideas about what Hitler had in mind at this time in 1925 and what occurred in the final solution of the Jewish question. And that issue of final solution meant different things along the way, which I will talk about. First of all, our notion was to capture how Hitler conceived of this as a partial autobiography. Uh, and then secondly, a manifesto that he would like to put into effect when coming to power in 1933. So our issue was to confront the notion that some people say Hitler's Mein Kampf is really not only laying the foundation of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, but his language is generating ideas that would put into effect once he comes to power in 1933. So these are seminal ideas. None of them are original. Everything was already said, written about, narrated, put into effect in rallies in the 1920s, even earlier. There was anti-Semitic literature that was very, very prominent, especially in Bavaria. And Hitler basically took these ideas, manufactured something in writing that was not original, but put into his actually um, probably roaming and wandering uh, literature piece, prison literature at that, that was able to concrete, make concrete a plan for what would happen in post-World War II, post post-World War II Germany. He's coming at this from someone who experienced the army, the defeat of Germany, uh, a depression, and he wanted to restore Germany to its finest, to create another German empire, as Mike had said, about a Germany that had far reach into the Eastern territories that would be Judenfrei, Jewish free, and would especially promote the notion of an Aryan civilization. So in order to document all that, we did interviews with the key people, Professor Magnus Brechten, who is a very, very wise historical consultant on the film, and Otmar Plockinger, uh, Pluckinger, who had been one of the key editors of the volume. So our starting point was, how do we situate this rabid anti-Semitism of Mein Kampf in our historical understanding? So in the bookends of this film, we will start with Charlottesville, 1917. We interspersed this with clips from uh, the 1934 Nazi rally 
at Nuremberg, featured in Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. And we cut it to show the resemblance of those, so those white supremacists in Charlottesville who talked about Jews not replacing us. Secondly, we look at the very end of the film, the bookend of Atlanta, Georgia, where a white supremacist group lit up in a type of spectacular show, a show of white supremacy, a swastika, and everyone gave the Nazi salute. So in between 19, or 2017 and 2018, uh, we show you Charlottesville 2017, I meant, you're right, 2017, I didn't mean 1917, uh, 2017 and 2018, we were able to show that these ideas are recurring once again. And what Mike ended on was what we saw as necessary to propose. So the beginning and end of our film really showcase what we see happening today. In the body of our documentary, we tried to feature how Hitler wrote a text basically that used language about Jews, the hypocrites, the cheaters, the hungry uh, for power, warmongers, all of that language was seminal form of what would come to power in 1933. Soon as Hitler did come as chancellor, all of these ideas were in the law. And that was the first step. step. And don't forget, overall, this is a step-by-step -step process. The Holocaust did not arise in a vacuum. It was slowly and surely prepared through law and violence. First of all, the laws in 33 and 34 already showed you as Jews, as degenerate. Secondly, had to be wiped out from commerce through the boycotting, and then from civil service in 1935. And then on the other hand, with violence, setting up the ESA, the stormtroopers, then the SS, and then finally the Gestapo. With law and violence, hand in hand, Hitler was able to put into effect a lot of the seminal ideas that you see in Mein Kampf. First of all, we show what happened in 1938. When <clears throat> Hitler invaded uh, Vienna, uh, Austria, as an annexation with the Lebensraum idea, he was able to incorporate another area of Germany's mother tongue. And that created a link now of fostering a development of the Aryan population. Secondly, in the latter part of <clears throat> 1938, what is orchestrated is probably an idea of how powerful uh, the German government can be nationally in terms of violence. We show how Kristallnacht was very effective in getting rid of the Jewish businesses, vandalizing the cemeteries, sending Jewish men to the concentration camp, Dachau primarily set up in 1933 for communist political prisoners and then later Jews, homosexuals, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So in 1938, with the idea of uh, Kristallnacht, David Crow talks about the shock that it created in Germany. Our newspapers, like the New York Times, covered it very, very briefly. But you see internationally what it created, a sense that Hitler has a target on the Jews that is now visual. And it was so striking for uh, the German population 
and the world population, but we saw something happening here that we should be afraid of. Next, in 1941, June of 41, uh, Professor Crow talks about the, jo uh, the Bolsheviks Jews and the target that he had <clears throat> on their heads. So the Einsatzgruppen that we talk about in the longer film is the mobile killing unit that looks at men, women, and children as individuals who could be killed uh, tortured, uh, put into mass graves, and that also was a shock. This engendered the killing fields of Eastern Europe, and then finally the gas chambers, because the German soldiers, as we know, were psychologically damaged by the notion of killing innocent people. So a faster process was created in starting 1941-42 in the gas chambers. We highlight the importance of the Wannsee Conference in that suburb of Berlin in January of 1942. 15 major administrators from the German government, including the hanging judge uh, Roland Freisler and Adolf Eichmann, under the leadership of uh, Heydrich, Reinhard Heydrich, you have a group of people now mentioning that we will destroy the population of Jews of Europe to the number of 11 million. That was the initial goal set. These were the units, as they were called, who had to be processed. So in that way, we can see that already that language that was in Mein Kampf is becoming radicalized. The Jews are inferior. They are trying to control the world. We have to get rid of their uh, presence. And the way we do it is by a final solution. <clears throat> in the film, a larger film, uh, Magnus Brechtin talks about the meaning of the final solution. And the first was <clears throat> in 1938 to send the Jews out of the country to a place like Madagascar. That was the meaning of the first notion of final solution. But then in 1942, four years later, it becomes something much more solidified, a goal to physically eliminate the Jews from all of Europe. So with the ghettos, with the transport, with the selections, and then finally the gassing of the Jews, we see that the final solution is now something effective for cleaning all of Europe of the Jewish population. So this is 1945 when we see at the very, very end the liberation of the camps and next step that we deal with is the Nuremberg trials. We, Mike Bryant and I worked, and my wife Susan, worked on a film on Nazi law, and we show the Nuremberg trials as not a Holocaust trial, but a trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The actual historical Holocaust trial would be held in Jerusalem with Adolf Eichmann, because that was truly a Holocaust trial. So we end with the Nuremberg trials showing that we have finally brought to justice. And we end with that notion that this spirit of Mein Kampf is still alive today with Atlanta, Georgia. So throughout the film, we raise the question, is Mein Kampf really a basis for the Holocaust? Is the language genocidal? Is Hitler already thinking in terms of genocide? We cannot say that absolutely, but indirectly, that language of the anti-Semitism that is very strong and rabid is laying the groundwork. 
that we can say. But terms such as, you know, getting rid of the Jews that he does use, uh, sidelining them, moving them out of all of our uh, society, does give us the first step toward the Holocaust. So I hope you, you know, see this documentary as a way of confronting the issues that are set out in Mein Kampf. It will not, never solve it, but it raises an idea of what he said in Mein Kampf about the Jews that could be a stepping stone to the laws, the violence, and finally, the final solution of the Jewish question. Thank you. Let's look at the film now so we can uh, see, and then we will be able to speak about this much more closely later on. So in the documentary, we tried to do something different from, you know, regular either Holocaust films or Mein Kampf films. There are three or four that uh, have come to mind uh, over the past years that, you know, I didn't want to watch because I wanted to do something different. And in this case, you know, the last few minutes of the regular film talks about basically how a lot of this anti-Semitism has resurfaced. You know, we call it the ugly head of Hydra. You knock off one head, another appears. And with the rise of militarism in the ranks of an extremism in Germany, and even in the United States, we see a repetition of some of these ideas that were already present in Mein Kampf. So that notion of the relevance of Mein Kampf has been at the core of the film. And I'm sending down to Ron uh, a copy of the full film, so it'll be in your library if you want to see it. Um, and I hope you know it did enlighten you in a little way. I know a lot of this information uh, may have surfaced in other ways, but my interpretation with my wife, you know, would be something to add to our scholarly contribution to Holocaust studies. So thank you. We'd be happy to uh, get over here. Uh, we'd be happy to take any questions uh, that either members of our live audience or our virtual audience might have. Yes. Um, banning books. Do we ban this book, or do we keep it in the public domain so we can have discussions like this? Which yeah, I think that's very helpful. Shall I take that one, John? Um, no. Yeah. I, I. I mean, even after 1945, I talked about the fact that that uh, Mein Kampf could not be republished in Germany for 70 years, but the book was never illegal. You could get used copies. I remember being in uh, uh, used bookstores in the 1990s when I was doing my dissertation research and going to uh, the Antiquariat in Freiburg where I was uh, doing my dissertation research and going in and seeing copies of Mein Kampf. I was really taken aback. I wasn't expecting to see that, but it, they were widely available. And of course, you could order them online. There were online internet copies of the book available. So the book itself was never really banned per se. What was banned is the republication of it in German. Um, and for all the reasons I suggested in my presentation, I, I think that it is, uh, it is worth re-engaging with today, but one needs to be careful, much in the way in which the uh, Munich Institute for Contemporary History was cautious in issuing their edition of the book in 2016. If you, just one second, let me step over here and show you what they produced. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting. 
this is this is it, right? 2,000 2, pages of text with over 3,000 footnotes, annotated footnotes, which are designed to interrogate the text, to place it contextually in its historical context, but also to challenge Hitler. So you have this constant running commentary of experts in the field. There were was a team of four historians, but of course they had a lot more people working, doing legwork for the, for the main historians who uh, edited the book. And they are able to challenge at every juncture the points at which Hitler makes outrageous whoppers, you know, just, just complete lies that he's trying to foist onto on his reader. So that you know, appropriations of this text by neo-Nazis, which is always a consideration today, can, can be challenged. Now, Anson Robbenbach and some other scholars have, have uh, debated whether that is even adequate. Can you really equip a text like this with, with safeguards that can prevent uh, the ill-disposed from, from misappropriating the text. And I don't know, I don't know the answer to that question, but at the very least, you can, you can call these ideas into a question, you can cross-examine them and ultimately refute them. Pretending that they're not there is not going to serve the cause of human liberty and human decency in any way. Because the ideas are out there. I mean, as, as John said in his, his presentation, we're seeing a of a return of, of these notions today. So I think it's important to confront them. And as Magnus Brecken says in our book, if I may also, so this is it, it just came out a few weeks ago. In our book, he makes this argument as well and says that from the perspective of the Munich Institute for Contemporary History, you can use Mein Kampf as a way to, uh, to, to discredit and to attack and undermine the kinds of assertions that Hitler makes in Mein Kampf and that are reappearing even today. John, did you want to weigh in on this at all? Uh, I was going to respond to the second question that appeared, Mike, but um, I think that was a very good you know, response to you know, what was asked. Um, maybe we can move on to that second question because there'll be a few more. The, first, the second question was, what is Hitler's relationship to Christianity? And I could say it in, in many, many words, but very, very succinctly, there was a sense of building the Nazi party on some of the propaganda coming out of the Catholic Church. Uh, the notion of propaganda that he sets up in one of the chapters early on was that you have to use uh, your means of propaganda, repeat it, attract your audience, and say it in different ways. You have to say it colorfully. So he was, he and Goebbels really used some of the platforms from Christianity. But at the same time, he tried to take the Christian churches and merge them under one national church, as you may know, uh, the national church under uh, Ludwig Müller, and he wanted that bishop to be a nationalist figure leading religion to Nazism. Many Catholics uh, did not follow along, and especially uh, August Carlos, of, no, Augustus, uh, Clemens Augustus von Gallen, and he protested mightily against this and against euthanasia. So when there was a situation that Christianity, especially the Catholic Church, uh, faced and confronted strongly uh, Hitler and his laws or ideas, he backed out, he backed down. And one of the cases was especially euthanasia. Uh, that was the 1939 uh, letter that came out to Buhler uh, and you know, Karl Brandt, his physician, that said we must use mercy killing uh, to help our civilization. But when the Catholic Church especially protested this, he backed down, but yet overall 200,000 uh, uh, ideas, or let's say this maybe 200,000 disabled people were eliminated <coughs> through euthanasia. 
There's now a beautiful memorial to that in Berlin. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, a different style. Some individuals uh, in the Catholic Church, especially, would follow along with Hitlerism and na nationalism and didn't find a problem. But there were many resistors at the same time uh, that did not follow along, protested, and some of them came out of uh, the younger groups. The White Rose, you know, came out of the spirituality of Protestantism and Catholicism. They believed in uh, Count, uh, Count Clemens von Pollen, Pollen, who was the Monsignor at that time. So there was, you know, there are two sides to the relationships with Christianity. There were some other. Hands. There were a few oh. other questions. Yeah, in the audience. Yes. Um, so I do have a question, more of a comment. Um, so there is a book by a man named John Toland uh, that's called Adolf Hitler: The Definitive Biography, um, in which he talks about the fact that Adolf Hitler actually really admired the reservation system here in the United States in the mid-1800s, and the fact that um, Native Americans were um, relocated to these not camps, but reservations, um, and that there was laws and violence against them, there were genocidal policies against them. And essentially, here in this country, there's been a genocide of Native people, um, and the reservation system still very much exists. Um, but it was all part of this uh, justification, right, of land dispossession, which you talked about, and the need for land, right, to um, to justify the westward expansion of the colonizers here in this country. Um, so it's more of an observation and the parallels and the fact that Adolf Hitler, you know, maybe didn't, this wasn't an original idea. In fact, he saw what was going on here in the United States and was like, this is brilliant. Let me try to replicate it. Um, so I, again, not a question, just an observation. Um, but, you know, when you look at how much land is left here for Native Americans, it's less than, um, and all still very much cordoned off in reservations. Um, so perhaps if you know Adolf Hitler had been successful, um, he could just look to what's going on here in the U.S. Yeah, I 100% I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> we. Uh, you repeat the question, yeah. or we can hear anything. <laughs> um, oh boy. I can sum, I can summarize. Oh, some of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, the, uh, I, I don't know your name. I'm afraid. It's Judy Urquhart. Judy uh, was asking about uh, the fact that Hitler may have looked at Indian reservations and the treatment of native peoples in the United States as a, uh, as a model or as a touchstone for his own uh, population policies, especially in, in Eastern Europe. And of course, there's been a, a lot, of, lot of attention given to that over the past 50 years, really going back to Hannah Arendt. She, she was uh, among the first to, to note these connections between colonialism or imperialism on the one hand and, and, uh, and Nazi um, genocide on the, on the other, Nazi expansion. There's a, a book that came out in the 1990s that I recommend to, uh, to everybody if you haven't read it yet or not, but uh, it's called Exterminate All the Brutes by Sven Lindqvist, in which he sets forth a similar sort of thesis in, in, uh, in a very, very brief book. It's only 170 pages long, but he makes a very stirring and I think convincing case that uh, that the Nazis were really bent upon a colonial project that right. was informed by the, their, their understanding, their study of Western colonialism uh, in, in the New World and in other parts of the world too. Yeah. And similar tactics. I mean, he, not, you know, Hitler was um, presenting Jews as, as parasites, as um, you know, just people to be exterminated. And apparently in this book, um, Hitler is quoted as saying um, he, Praise the efficiency of America's extermination by starvation and combat of the red savages who could not be tamed by captivity. Yeah. So very sort of similar uh, strategies, right, to um, dehumanize their target right. um, you know, of extermination. And of course, we, we, we know, too, that when, when the Germans moved into Eastern Europe, from Operation Barbarossa in particular, the invasion of the Soviet Union, they specifically released their soldiers from military justice. Uh, Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions were all suspended, unlike the Western Front, where they were more or less observed 
but not in the East. And I think that Hitler probably was looking at, yet again, another colonialist uh, project. Uh, in, in North America in particular and other parts of the world, the Western powers deliberately uh, released their soldiers from the requirements of the law of war. And they're, and they're dealing with colonial peoples. It was open season on them. There was no military restraint that had to be observed towards them. And I think, I really believe that Hitler was looking at this as an example and simply importing that then into the German treatment of uh, Eastern European peoples. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, kind of a few things. Um, actually, there's a historian called Edward uh, Westermann. He wrote a book called Hitler's Ostkrieg and the Indian War. Mm -hmm. So you might want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. He also wrote a book recently called Drunk on Genocide, which is hold on today. Um, what was the title? I couldn't hear what you said. The first one is uh, by Edward Westermann. Oh, no, Westermann, yeah, Westermann. Um, right, he wrote right. Hitler's Ostkrieg. And the Hitler's Indian Ostkrieg, War. Yeah. Um, I'm and I'm repeating it for the people online. They can't hear it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the second one, I think when you talk about reservations, you can talk definitely to the Roma, um, how Hitler and Himmler were believing that maybe the Roma should be put onto reservations. But the whole idea of Madagascar, I think we kind of maybe skew it a little bit, that the whole idea of Madagascar wasn't so much as a reservation, but more the, as a large open air yeah. ghetto. Yeah. Um, as a holding cell for eventual extermination. Yeah, there, there, there's a question about Madagascar. Uh, again, I'm summarizing for people online. And, um, yeah, I've really changed my own thinking about Madagascar. Uh, because Madagascar is typically cited as an example of, of the immigration plans that eventually collapse. Right? The first one is NISCO, the NISCO plan that Eichmann comes up with to resettle the Jews in the Lublin district that falls through because Mueller, the head of the Gestapo, vetoes it. And then they look towards Madagascar as a way to, uh, to solve the so-called Jewish problem. Now, there's a book that came out last year. I think it was last year. Uh, I've been reading it. I'm almost, almost to page 900 at this point. Uh, it's by Peter Longerich. Uh, it's a biography of Hitler. And he has several, several parts of one of his chapters devoted to Madagascar. And he, what he argues is it really blew me away. Because I had, I had never, ever heard the topic of Madagascar treated in the way in which Longerick has. He, he claims that the, the person they had in mind, the Nazis had in mind for, for this colony of Madagascar, was, um, was Philip Boller. And as John, John, you may mention of Philip Boller just a few minutes ago, Boller was the head of the euthanasia program. So he was in, in the, the Führer's chancellery, he was the head of, of, of organizing or co-organizing the mass murder of the mentally handicapped. And I think it's quite significant, as, as does Longerich, that a man who was already wading through blood was being tabbed as a possible governor for, for this Jewish, so-called Jewish colony in Madagascar. And what it suggests to me, and it suggests to the Longerich as well, is that the plan was not to resettle the Jews, the plan was to move them there and murder them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've completely changed my thinking on Madagascar. I initially thought of it as an immigration plan. No, I mean, the fact that Bodo was envisioned as the governor is very significant to me. But it's a matter of interpretation. Could you repeat the name of the book? Could you repeat the name yes. of the book in the author? It's just called Hitler, and it's a biography by uh, Peter Longeric. It's been translated into in English. Oh, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. Oh, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. Yes, I was just informed. It was. It's in oh, the okay. chat. Yeah. Thank you. Another comment, um, is the Mein Kampf, the annotated uh, German version, is it being translated into English? Just because, I mean, a lot of people don't I speak don't German. So. Yeah, and I, it would be wonderful to have that for Americans to be able to discuss with their students or provide for their students. Yeah, listen, if they do that, I'd be happy to participate. In, I don't want to do it by myself. It's <laughs> 2,000 pages. but. Uh, no, that, that's something I would, I would eagerly participate in if they ever wanted to translate this phenomenal work of scholarship. I, I mean, think American English audiences are missing out. 2,000 pages. 2,000 pages, yeah. But, uh, but, but again, the, the, the commentary is like a book unto itself. And it is, it's magnificent scholarship. It's cutting edge stuff prepared by teams of historians looking at primary source documents. And, uh, my understanding is that uh, as of, you know, few weeks ago, there was no plan in place to, to translate it. it. There's a French edition that's being prepared. In fact, uh, Otmar Plückinger, who was probably the world's leading expert on Mein Kampf and contributed to our, uh, our volume, uh, is working on the, uh, on the French edition with numerous other people. 
and I'm not sure what the status of that is at this point. I don't know how close it is to being being published. But uh, so there are there are plans for other languages, but I just don't think that they're they plan to do it in English yet. Shame. It is. It is. A sh you think that will change at some point? You know, Mike, could I mention uh, something about an early, the earlier question about uh, the Native American reservations? Uh, Hitler loved Karl May's understanding of the West, and the West was filled with, as someone mentioned, savages. And that's where he got his knowledge of this Untermensch, the underdog, you know, the lesser human. But I think also, you know, if you read uh, Isabel Wilkerson's uh, book on caste, I'd say, you know, over this COVID era, I read maybe 25 books out of necessity, but out of, you know, a uh, desire to learn a little more about our current work that we're doing uh, in film and literature and history. But in cast, Wilkerson is able to show that there is a caste system in India, in the Jewish relations with Aryans in the Third Reich, and also Jim Crow era. In one of the questions in the chat was, or mentioned, that Hitler based the 1935 Nuremberg laws on some of the notions of Jim Crow laws especially with the notion of one drop of blood. So I think, you know, of all the books that I've read during this period, that one stands out for linking things that I never had in mind in terms of colonization, uh, the Rhineland bastards uh, that Hitler talks about uh, in Mein Kampf. All of these things, you know, came together for me in understanding that there is a pattern of this idea of the other in the caste system of all three uh, civilizations. I highly recommend it. Emily, did you have something to? Uh, Nick McCalda has got his hand up. Yes, Nick. Oh, let, I, we have to. Try again. You're, you're right. Right. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, just, just a brief question. I mean, obviously, there's been some discussion about, you know, I'm going to put air quotation marks about euthanasia. Of course, that's a euphemism. But to what degree in Mein Kampf does Hitler talk about what ultimately becomes T4? Uh, it's just something I was curious to, to, to hear about. That, that would actually be an excellent question for John because he wrote an article sp precisely on that, <laughs> on that topic okay. for... For Hitler's okay, I, I feed book. it to John. Yeah, Thank you. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, right, Nick. Uh, back in 1996, 95, 96, uh, we did a documentary like this and a book dealing with Nazi medicine and the social issues and the ethical issues involved. And what we discovered was a step by step understanding of how the idea of mercy killing, in quotes again, as you said, it's a euphemism for euthanasia, and how it was mentioned early on in terms of eliminating uh, the disabled. And actually, there is a section in Mein Kampf where Hitler discusses that the disabled should be eliminated from our society. They are welfare cases. They are drags on our society. So that was something that was already in the mind of Hitler. Then when the individuals working with euthanasia were mobilized and also who volunteered, they came into the Holocaust or you know, elimination plan because they had experience. A film that I would highly recommend is Costa Gavras, Amen. Mm -hmm. And this film is very powerful because it takes the deputy of Rolf Hochut, the scandalous, in a way, controversial, I should say, 1965 uh, play called The Deputy, D 
dealing with the Pope's silence during World War II. And what Costa Gavras does shows a link of what you're saying between the euthanasia of Kurt Gerstein's uh, niece in the film, but his sister-in-law in reality, and how the doctor there, who remains nameless, he's simply the doctor, Paternan Mengele, and how he evolves to someone who works with Cyclone B and the process of literally elimination of the Jews right to the very end of the film. At the close of the film, ironically, this doctor escapes in the rat lines to the Vatican and Bishop Alois Hudal, uh, who is pro-fascist, a pro-Nazi, said, you know, the United States doesn't need, you know, anyone else except scientists, Operation Paperclip. But if you're a doctor, you can go to South America. You could stay with me until the next boat arrives. You can go to Argentina, perhaps. So in that film, I think you have maybe a little answer to what you're asking about, how it's done in step by step from the individual doctors who worked with euthanasia, studied the ideas of how we could process literally these units in the gas chambers, starting with carbon monoxide out of a tractor that you see in this film, Amen, to execution by the Eisensatzgruppen, and lastly to the gas chambers because that could be on a massive scale. Uh, the T4 came out of Berlin and it orchestrated a lot of these ideas from human experimentation uh, to Cyclone B manufacturing and lastly led up right up to the final processing through the crematoria all the way to uh, the Nuremberg trials in 1945 when all of these trials, the 12 Nuremberg trials, uh, came to take place, let's say. So that's a long way of saying that there is a link from what you're saying, Nick, from euthanasia to the final solution through T4. And uh, Dr. Robert Berger, who died several years ago, he was a Holocaust survivor who wrote in our book on uh, medicine ethics in the Third Reich that all this human uh, experimentation promulgated through T4, uh, and that was the address of the office, Tiergartenstrasse 4 in Berlin, and all of these were actually very poorly done. A lot of them were faked. They wanted more money. The tests were inauthentic. They proved nothing. And in the end, Dr. Katz in our film says, they forget about the value of human life. And for the sake of humanity, you have sacrificed the human life. So, you know, if you want to see Nazi medicine, uh, it's distributed by First Run Feature, it's streamed, and it gives you an idea of those topics that, you know, Nick was raising in T4, euthanasia, and the final solution. Thank you very much. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. You mean chapters in the book that we recently published? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think if we have anything specifically on psychology. Most most of the work is was contributed by historians. Um, I have written a little bit on on that very topic in some of my some of my work, especially a world history of war crimes. But uh, yeah, we don't really delve so much into the psychology of perpetration as as we do into into the, the text of Mein Kampf itself and maybe some of Hitler's psychology. Yeah, John, did you want to? Yeah, Mike. That too? In terms of the uh, sense of authoritarianism, 
you know, the sections on leadership in Mein Kampf, you know, really lay out what you want in a strong leader. And that comes out in our film too with Paul Bookbinder from UMass Boston. And, you know, that person has to be charismatic, forceful, domineering, and he can't be a weak species. He must have control at all times. And the language that Hitler uses is very negative and very sexist. You can't be like a woman and you have to be this strong, forceful person who's willing to use violence for control. And I think those sections, you know, in Mein Kampf really are highlighted by this notion that uh, Hitler has of leading the Nazi party to be a leader above all, uh, who's coming out of prison, you know, trying to be on good behavior, but at the same time, trying to be this forceful leader who could bring together the masses into the Nazi party. And I think that's, you know, written up in maybe two or three sections that I've read of my Kampf. Other questions, either from our virtual audience or our actual in-person audience? Comments, questions, responses? Yes, ma'am. When you, when you use that term, are, are you thinking of Adorno's yeah. concept? Okay, like the, the, the F scale. Yeah, um, very controversial, as you know. I mean, I'm sitting on yeah, oh yeah, Mike, yeah. What's the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question is is whether um, wh whether whether the F scale and the authoritarian personality may not shed some light on on these these issues that we have been delving into. And uh, I, I'm, I'm actually very partial to the, uh, to the work of Adorno in this regard. I, I believe there, there may be something to it, but of course it's been roundly attacked, including by, by psychologists. Uh, Adorno, for those of who may not know of Adorno's work, he did a, a study after World War II uh, and claimed that, that one of the reasons why Hitler was so effective in mobilizing the masses is that there was an authoritarian personality type and it wasn't just unique to Germany. Uh, he actually did his studies in the United States, uh, the so-called F scale. That the F stands for fascist, of course. And um, there were certain attributes that, uh, that he believed correlated with support for inhumane politics that could lead in the direction of genocide. But um, again, a very controversial sort of thing. And there, there really aren't, from what I can gather, all that many scholars today who are willing to subscribe to Adorno's view. Uh, I, I find myself being more sympathetic than a lot of others. Um, and ultimately, I don't think that it's a total explanation for why people participated in the crimes of the Third Reich or, or other, other inhumane crimes in other countries. I think there, there might be an element of perpetrators or certain stratum of perpetrators who uh, might fit into that category of a fascist personality who succumb to, the, to, to authoritarianism and authoritarian rule. But of course, as we know, so many of the perpetrators were, were not particularly ideological. And that was the kind of the gist of Christopher Browning's uh, very famous study uh, of the Reserve Police B Battalion 101. Uh, came out in the 1990s and is still in print and uh, has gotten a lot of attention over the years. But his, his, his view is that so many of the perpetrators were, were not ideological warriors, but in fact were seduced by by power structures uh, that they inserted themselves into or were inserted into uh, and, and were then cajoled through peer pressure and the need to measure up you know, to being a part of the group and that ultimately accounted for their participation in atrocity. But I'm certainly sympathetic to, to Adorno's work here. Well, uh, we, yeah. we want to think about well, what can be done. Right, the, yes. Yes. So yes. Yes. Or bringing them up, you know, how can you bring them up not to be so rigid as the right. authoritarian personality? But yeah. The, 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 the question was how can how can we um, how can we teach this topic? Thank you very much for being on hand. Greatly appreciate your being here. Um,
how can we teach this to, to young people? I mean, is, is there something in the authoritarian personality model that might be uh, fodder for instruction, uh, either high school, junior high schools, maybe even in college? And um, I, I do try to talk about such things in my class uh, when, I, when I teach Holocaust. And I, do, I talk about all the models, all the, all the models that uh, Robert uh, James Waller has really uh, done a lot of work in this regard to his, um, his book, and I'm blanking on the name of it right now, um, Ordinary Evil, I think, uh, has, has done a lot, of, a lot of legwork on this as well, setting forth some of the leading theories and then advancing his own theory, which is a, a more psychologically oriented approach to the topic, and to, which I'm very sympathetic to. Mike says, Shauna Brown has a question. Uh, sort of a two-part question. Um, did it bother, I don't know if this comes out in Mein Kampf because I haven't read it and I probably never will, but um, did it bother Hitler that he didn't have the classic characteristics of what he thought of as an Aryan, you know, with his dark hair and dark eyes? That's number one. And number two is, is it true that he was like a quarter Jewish? Yeah, I, I can address that. That's well, I, I can address both questions. But that that second one is something I actually take on in my Holocaust course when I teach it. And the answer is no. Insofar as we can tell, he was not Jewish, right? I mean, a lot a lot of people have this belief even today. Uh, it's an it's really a myth that goes back to the Nuremberg war crimes trials, when um, when the Governor General of Poland, Hans Frank, testified at Nuremberg that. Um, that he was approached by Hitler, and Hitler asked him supposedly to, to investigate whether he may not have had a Jewish grandparent. And there, there, there was research done into this by the Gestapo and some other state security agencies of the Third Reich. And from what they could gather, and then in all subsequent scholarship, from what we can gather today, there is, there's no basis to this myth that Hitler was, was partially Jewish. Right? It's, uh, it's simply not, not true insofar as we know. What was the first part of your question again? <laughs> did, did it bother Hitler or did it come oh, out in my comp any yeah. kind of worry that, you know, he wasn't blonde haired and blue eyed? Well, if, if he was concerned about it, I'm not aware that he ever expressed that concern. I mean, keep in mind, he talks about the model. The model really was Heydrich. Heydrich was considered to be the model Aryan and certainly Hitler did not look anything like Heydrich, tall, athletic, six foot four, looked like the straight out of central casting, the perfect Aryan, and Hitler looked nothing like that. But keep in mind that Hitler defined um, Aryanism in terms of German nationality. And he, of course, was German. He was actually Austrian, but then became a German citizen in the, 19, the 1930s. So he considered himself to be, to be Aryan by virtue of uh, the fact that he spoke, spoke the language and he was ethnically and racially Aryan. He was a member of the German people, the leader of the German people. That was enough. He didn't have to have the blonde hair, you know, the tall athletic frame, the blue eyes. That, that was the ideal, but it was, not, uh, it was not necessary to have those qualities. So. You know, Mike, could I, could I mention also that you know, Goebbels, who had been you know, promoting, obviously, this sense of Aryanism and the perfect uh, you know, Aryan, he himself had a club foot, so he fits in to, you know, the situation of someone who is disabled. And I think, you know, this whole cast of, you know, nationality that you're talking about is very, very basic. Uh, connecting Austria to Germany because of uh, blood, actually. And right from the very beginning, I think on page three of Mein Kampf in the English edition, uh, you have the, the blood of Austria and the blood of Germany are linked. They're both linked. So that was already uh, an idea of Lebensraum, the living room experience. And then, of course, he proceeds to East, the far east in Europe to uh, the, land, the land of richness in you know, uh, Russia. Uh, so that's Operation Barbarossa, obviously. But I think... Uh, my article in the book is on race, blood, and the Holocaust. And, you know, basically some of the ideas that Mike has mentioned in 
of Aryanism and um, races, the, the idea of race coming out of Gobino. You know, I show a progression through Darwinism uh, and the fittest survive. And gradually it links up with the ideas of Jews are impure in their blood and mixing the blood of an Aryan with a Jew is obviously going to destroy our civilization. Mike says that in our film, but you see that coming across in several places in Mein Kampf. So it's nationhood, uh, the idea of Aryanism, but purity of blood. Uh, and that obviously holds true for the disabled, uh, for the idea of uh, homosexuals, you know, or the pink triangle in the camps. So I think those couple of ideas link together, you know, in my mind after reading Mein Kampf. Yes, sir. Um, social Darwinism. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to bring up my own work in the Gilded Age. Um, there's a distinction between social Darwinism, what we normally refer to, and reform Darwinism. And Darwin himself did not use that phrase. He, he, he was opposed to it. Spencer. But, Spencer. Well, that's what I was going to say. Spencer. Spencer, yeah. who more popular, or English, but more popular in the United States, because he fit in with the whole cultural uh, Alger Hiss uh, kind of uh, success. Oh, Horatio, Horatio uh, Alger, yeah, Horatio uh, Alger, right, uh, right. Uh, rags to riches and a, right. a self-made person. Uh, so <clears throat> Spencer would say to anyone disabled mentally or uh, uh, physically that they were a drag on society, as John mentioned earlier, and that uh, they should be eliminated, and it's a good thing that they be eliminated yep. because they drag down the progress of the uh, society. Absolutely, yeah. Hitler's work is is uh, unmistakably social Darwinist, right? And and you laid your finger directly on one of the major social Darwinistic tenets of his um, of his thinking. John, you've done a lot of work in this area. Did you want to talk about it at all? Uh, yeah. This, the notion of, you know, starting with Spencer, obviously, but what was more interesting for the National Socialist Party was adapting some of the ideas of uh, the Untermenschen and the Ubermenschen in blood. And all, at the late 19th century and early 20th century, there was a lot of physiology being done, especially in Germany. And the idea of blood purity became something that was a focus for uh, Hitler in Mein Kampf, but also, you know, later on in making distinctions. And that notion in America with the Jim Crow era of one drop of blood makes you a Negro uh, is something that was used in 1935 with the Nuremberg Laws. These were hastily created in a few days right before the 1935 Nazi Party rally uh, in Nuremberg. But the judges and the lawyers who were involved in establishing that notion of blood and how it links the German people together uh, is coming actually from some of the ideas in the US. And already in the 1600s, late 1600s, uh, in the Virginia colony, there was this concept that you can't intermarry with someone who is, quote, unquote, a mulatto, uh, an Indian, or a Negro. Because don't forget, in 1619, the first blacks were coming uh, you know, to the West, out of Africa. So blood became the link for the German people. And because of the science uh, and the, even uh, Hitler's notion of Robert Koch, uh, or Koch, is it pronounced, Mike? Koch, yeah. Koch, uh, no relationship to anybody living, but uh, in terms of what he was uh, saying, 
and discovering in microbiology that you know his experiments show you uh, what the bacillus is and how you can cure diseases. So Hitler takes on this notion, as Titania Kluber says in our film, of being the healer of society. And the healer meant taking the notions of disease in our blood system and eliminating them. So that becomes an image, you know, all the way through the study of Nazi medicine. And that was a focus of our, uh, our film in 1995, uh, Nazi medicine in the shadow of the right. The doctors who were the eminent uh, leaders in society, the Aryans, but the Jews were the best doctors. So the Aryan doctors were very happy when they got rid of the Jewish doctors through the Civil Service Act because they could take over their profession. Uh, but still, there's, you know, that study of the Aryan doctor, even the experimentation, you know, some of the transfer of blood, all of that was done with this notion that blood links a people. There's a question from uh, Robert Chase. Yes, I was wondering if um, Mein Kampf lays out Hitler's views on how to seize and keep power and what other subjects uh, that haven't been covered right now, just summarize what's in it. Uh, yes, I mean, Hitler's approach, of course, is that um, is that power was uppermost and that it should be vested in his hands. There, there was, this, you know, this is an old idea that goes, goes back to European romanticism of the uh, 19th century. The notion of the great, art, you know, the great artist, the great, the great figure, who, uh, the great genius, who would be able to uh, impose his will on reality and lead, lead his people to the promised land. That, that, was, that was one of the, one of the dominant motifs of, um, of Mein Kampf. And John, you made reference to uh, Paul Bookbinder in his essay um, on politics and the political leader in Mein Kampf. Yes, um, he goes back to uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, some of the ideas of how the leader must use law and violence together to control. And of course, those are the two vehicles of maintaining a Germany that is united. And if one didn't work, and I think there is something, you know, correct me, Mike, if I'm wrong, but several hundred laws against the Jews, whether it is property, whether it's their art, which their businesses, uh, their blood, uh, their genealogy, all of that, you know, over the years would prevent, you know, uh, the Jews from taking over. And the second means was violence. I mentioned in our film, especially Kristallnacht, which is a glowing idea of what power is to be able to use a campaign right across Germany uh, to destroy, you know, a Jewish civilization in terms of, you know, the you already destroyed the books in 33. Now you destroy the businesses. You take these, you know, the religious element and destroy that. All of that really shows you how power uh, can control a civilization, uh, a, a very rich civilization of the Jews. Could, could I add something too in response to, to the question? Oh. So one thing that is very clear from Mein Kampf is Hitler's belief that, um, that when you're pursuing this historical mission, the mission of, of leading Germany, pr you know, purifying it of its, of it, its, in order to return it to a, to a, a high level of racial uh, uh, timber, of racial quality, anything was justified, right? He, he really believed that, that the ends justified the means. So if this meant, you know, doing, doing acts that might be considered criminal, then that's what had to be done. He's very clear about this in Mein Kampf. And of course, after his prison term, he tried to, to, to lead a, uh, a so-called legal, or pursue a legal path to power, and he did for the most part up until 1933. But already in, in Mein Kampf in 1925 and 1927, he's talking about necessity 
justifying all acts in order to achieve the glorious goal of the racial state. And I think there is a powerful criminality, a potential for criminality built into this very, this very statement, this very view that, uh, that, that all means were, uh, were justified and all means were legitimate in pursuing this goal. And I think that uh, we might be at the end of our, right. our time, as I yeah. see Ron we, sidling up to the We've had the podium. more questions than we've ever had in this. So thank you. That's a tribute to both you and John. And to the topic. And, and the topic, of course. So thank you so much, John. And, and thank you. you know. And I hope we're, I know that uh, Emily has uh, purchased two of these books. Ex outstanding. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not available in the United States uh, for publication. You can get the Kindle version. Right, uh, in Amazon. But, and, yes. But, but they'll uh, be available in our collection as soon as they come in. So uh, th thanks, everybody, for participating both online and in person. It was great seeing everybody. Yeah, we had a very good showing. So thank you. John, thank you, thank you again. Thank you, hey, John. Thanks very much, Ron. Look for, I'll look forward to, re to seeing the whole film. Oh, yeah? yeah? Right. I'll be sending it down to you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank everybody. Uh